because, according to the Minister of Defence, Roger Hawkins, they'd been aware for some time of a considerable build-up of trained terrorists there. But it's hardly a coincidence that at the very time the Rhodesian warplanes were launching their attack, the Prime Minister Ian Smith was announcing his new initiative for a political settlement of the Rhodesian problem, a plan which he knew would be opposed by the black nationalist leaders and their guerrilla followers based outside Rhodesia. Now he struck a devastating military blow against one of those leaders, Mr. Robert Mugabe and his ZANU operation. The effect on morale inside Rhodesia has been electric, and for the rest of the world, it's a restatement of the message that's so often been sent from this country. Don't ever write us off. From the Mozambique side, official reports tonight discounted the Rhodesian claim. The Mozambique version of the raids is that more than 80 people were killed, mostly women and children. They say that in the Tumboi action in the north, their own forces routed the invaders and five Rhodesian soldiers were killed. In the Middle East, Jordan has said she'll only attend President Sadat's Cairo conference if the other Arab states join in. But King Hussein has praised President Sadat's courage in visiting Jerusalem. The United States won't yet say whether she'll go to the meeting. President Carter is to hold a news conference on Wednesday. Only Israel has definitely said she'll be there. After receiving a formal invitation today, the Prime Minister, Mr. Begin, said two senior officials would represent his country. The executive of the Fire Brigades Union is seeing the Prime Minister tomorrow at its own request to discuss the strike now in its third week. Our industrial correspondent says it's unlikely Mr. Callaghan will have anything new to offer the firemen, but he will be prepared to listen. The decision to seek the meeting was taken at a gathering of the Union's full executive council in London today. Negotiations on the strike have so far been held with the Home Secretary, and Ian Ross asked the Union's General Secretary why they had now decided to go to Mr. Callaghan. We want to see the Prime Minister rather than the Home Secretary. Oh, we're going to see the Prime Minister. He's agreed to see us. I, I no doubt the Home Secretary will be there. I'd be very surprised if he wasn't, but it's the Prime Minister that we're going to see. But you say that you're seeing him from a position of strength. I say that we're seeing the Prime Minister to discuss the situation with him and I'm not going to say one word that could be misinterpreted, misinterpreted by Ian Ross or anybody else. But the strike is still solid. The strike think? is still solid. There's no doubt about that. A scheme to settle the dispute was suggested tonight by leaders of NAFO, the senior fire officers union, when they met the Home Secretary to discuss their own pay claim. The senior officers are under increasing pressure to support the firemen and relations between them have worsened. Both unions have the same employer, the local authorities, so a solution could be in both their interests, as NAFO's president explained. What we have said to the Home Secretary tonight is that there may be a possibility, and he should look at the possibility of introducing the 42-hour week now with a six-hour overtime to the firemen and to the officers, well, mainly to the officers as far as we're concerned because we are not involved in the firemen's um, claim, introduce the 42-hour week, remain on the 48 and pay a six hours overtime and then allow the employers, who are the local authorities, to negotiate with the officers a productivity or a self-financing productivity deal. Over 100 patients at Dudley Road Hospital in Birmingham were led to safety tonight as troops fought a fire in the basement. It took them just over an hour to put out the blaze which destroyed files and hospital documents. Shop stewards representing the Outfitters Union at the Tyneside Shipbuilders Swan Hunters have recommended that the men should return to normal working. The 1,700 men have been banning overtime for three months because of a pay dispute. The ban has jeopardised the yard share of the £115 million Polish shipping order. A report from Fiona Johnston. This morning's meeting between national union officials and the shop stewards was a last-ditch attempt to keep the Polish order on Tyneside. After a week of wrangling, the seriousness of the situation was no longer in any doubt at all. Either the matter was resolved today or there'd be no Polish order at all. After four hours of talks, the national executive of the AUEW, Mr Gavin Laird, had this to say. At this meeting of shop stewards recommend a return to normal working by removing the overtime ban to allow the workers' grievances to be pursued through the recognised procedures. Within the time limit set out in the agreement, this will permit the acceptance of the terms and conditions in the Polish order. 
The seven ships will most certainly be constructed here in the shipyards in this area, given our members accept the resolution as put to them uh, by the shop stewards. Two of the big high street banks have increased their interest rates following last Friday's 2% rise in the minimum lending rate. National Westminster was the first to announce details when it increased its base lending rate by 1.5% to 7.5%. Lloyd's has kept its increase to only 1%. An appeal court has ruled that a woman who's suffered violence in her home from the man she lives with has a legal right to have him evicted, irrespective of whether she's married to him or owns the home. The ruling was made by a special appeal court of five judges headed by Lord Denning. The court decided by a majority of three to two to allow an appeal by Miss Jennifer Davis that her lover be made to leave their council flat in Hackney where they're joint tenants. Lord Denning said social justice demanded that personal rights should take priority over property rights and that in cases of violence, the law should make no distinction between a wife and a mistress. After the hearing, Mike Mackay asked Miss Davis if she was surprised by the court's ruling. Surprised by the verdict? Yeah, I was very surprised, yeah. Why? Because I thought things weren't going to go in my favour. Yet you decided that the case was worth fighting and bringing to the appeal court. Why did you decide to bring this case as high, to such a high court? Because I think it's very important, you know? A woman that's in my case that's not married, you know, I'm married. Police looking for Sir Rupert Mackerson, who's been missing since October, are asking people who bought tickets for a lecture he was to have organised to get in touch with them. The police started looking for Sir Rupert when holidaymakers complained his travel company hadn't given them tickets. Now they say he may be able to help them about a lecture for the National Arts Collection Fund, which has been cancelled. Sir Rupert, who inherited his title from his father, a Conservative MP, had offered to organise the lecture for the fund, a charity with 10,000 members and a worldwide reputation. Clifford Luton reports. It was into the Bloomsbury office of the National Art Collections Fund that Sir Rupert Mackerson walked earlier this year with the idea which seems to have been the last of his money-raising activities. He would hire the banqueting hall in Whitehall, promised Sir Rupert, black out every window, lay on slide projectors, a famous expert and coffee and biscuits, and make a sizable profit for the charity by selling tickets at three pounds and six pounds a head. 10,000 tickets were sent out inside the fund's newsletter. At least 150 members are known to have sent money, impressed by Sir Rupert's advertising material. Tonight, the organizers of the NACF said Sir Rupert had written them a letter saying he was going abroad and would deal with money matters on his return. Scotland Yard were appealing for any art lovers who'd joined the growing list of the Baronet's creditors to get in touch with them. And that's the news on too. Good night. And now the weather. Frost will be widespread tonight and there'll be thick fog in some places too, particularly in northern England and the Edinburgh-Glasgow area, where it may persist all day tomorrow. Elsewhere, it will become fairly bright again, but cold, with afternoon temperatures no higher than today. Four or five degrees centigrade in most parts, that's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And those are the weather prospects for tomorrow. Now, before open door, a look at one of tomorrow's programmes on BBC Two. What is an official secret? It's an official secret that there's a committee sitting to decide what is an official secret. It's chaired by Merlin Rees, Jim Callaghan and Shirley Williams sit on the committee. But now you know, and all the viewers know, you're guilty under the Official Secrets Act of knowing it because it is an official secret. The Man Alive report looks at the Official Secrets Act in On Her Majesty's Secretive Service tomorrow at 10.15 here on 2. Now, Open Door, the series in which the BBC hands over airtime to the public to use under their own editorial control. Tonight's Open Door presentation is a film made by a student of the National Film School, James O'Brien, together with a group of unemployed young people from Bradford. Black Future. <laughs>